Welcome to the Swedish Defence University and the very first World Acad Academic Forum Stockholm Summit. The World Academic Forum is initiated and hosted by the Stockholm Acad Academic Forum with the participation of 18 universities located in the city of Stockholm. During four days, Stockholm's academic community has come together to showcase the contributions of its academic institutions and of the researchers, uh, the contribution that these researchers can make to society through 27 different seminars and events. This particular session comes to you courtesy of the Swedish Defense University, a leading international institution for research and teaching on issues of security, crisis management, and defense policy. I'm Antoine Bousquet, Associate Professor at the Swedish Defense University, and I'm delighted to be sharing the stage today with three of my colleagues who will be sharing with us their expertise. Before I introduce uh, each of them, I would like to say a few words about the theme of the seminar that brings us together here. At a time of geopolitical upheaval with global ramification that felt most acutely right now on our continent, it is crucial for us to step back and reflect on the events of the last few months, place them in the context of longer term developments, going perhaps all the way to the end of the Cold War, and consider what may come next. So we are here to discuss, according to the title of this seminar, from soft power to hot war, what the war in Ukraine means for the world order. And I'll read to you uh, the description for the session. I'm going to set the agenda for us. The outbreak of the war in Ukraine has shaken the world order to its foundations, setting in motion its constituent parts, upending foreign and defense policies everywhere, and challenging many established assumptions and politicians, analysts, and the general public. In this seminar, our participants will reflect on the global implications of the war, considering issues such as great power competition, the role of NATO, the EU's sense of purpose, and the future of Sweden. In many ways, we come at the conclusion of a decade of geopolitical crises, which are now today coming to a head. Although the onset of the global war on terror in 2001 cast a shadow over the widespread optimism of the post-Cold War period, it left the underlying liberal order led by the United States largely unaffected. A prevalent faith in the multinational institutions of global governance, economic development through the expansion of world trade, and the inexorable spread of liberal democratic values remained untroubled. Yet, in the last decade, a succession of unforeseen events, from Brexit and the Trump presidency, to the Russian invasion of Crimea, and the crushing of the democracy movement in Hong Kong, have shaken these certainties. Faced with the rapid rise of China as a global superpower, and the maneuvers of a revanchist Russia, a politically divided United States and timorous European Union, have struggled in responding to the changing geopolitical realities. With the world still barely emerging from the COVID pandemic of the past two years, the present war in Ukraine now seems to have definitively turned the page of the post-Cold War period and formally inaugurated a new, a new era of international division and conflict. The questions that face us are the following. Will the force of arms and economic coercion rule over the influence of diplomacy institutions and norms in this new world? What are the alliances, corporations, and convergence of interests that will dominate? How will the European Union fare under the emerging multipolarity? Is there a future for the United Nations and the existing architecture of global governance? And finally, what are the challenges facing Sweden as it adjusts to this new reality? I have the pleasure of having with me three uh, members of this institution, uh, beginning with Associate Professor Marlena Britt, uh, who is uh, Pro Vice Chancellor and Head of Research here. Her areas of research include different aspects of European security policy, Europeanization, and Nordic cooperation. Shell Engbrecht is a Professor in Political Science here, a lifetime member of the Swedish Royal Academy of War Sciences and the Swedish Foreign Politics Society. His research interests range from European security policy to transatlantic security and grand power rivalry and diplomacy. Finally, Jakob Westberg is an associate professor of war studies and a senior lecturer in security policy and strategy at the Swedish Defense University. His research interests include Swedish defense and security policy, Nordic defense cooperation, and comparative strategy. Unfortunately, uh, Stephanie Winkler, um, 
could not join us today. Um, she uh, unfortunately um, is done with COVID. So a reminder that we are still under the shadow of that crisis, uh, but she, she's doing well and we hope she'll join us soon again. Um, so without any further ado, I will give uh, the floor to, to Jakob Westberg, who will uh, give us his introductory comments. Thank you very much. Um, you must excuse me for using notes. I didn't have time to, to rehearse this, so I thought that since this is a very um, serious moment and, and uh, potentially a lot of people viewing, I, I should try to be careful with what I say. But anyway, in my opening remarks, uh, I will address the, the main theme for this seminar. Uh, how does the war in Ukraine affect the present world order? Uh, to answer this question, I must first address another question. What is uh, a world order? One uh, partial answer to this question is provided by the structural realist tradition that analyzes world orders in terms of uh, an international system whose uh, interaction processes are dominated by independent unit states. Uh, the number of superpowers or great powers in a specific system uh, determines the polarity uh, of the system. Uh, a system dominated by one superpower is a unipolar system, a system with uh, two roughly equally strong dominating powers is a bipolar system and a system with three or uh, more main competing units is a multipolar system. The collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 left the United States as the sole remaining superpower, and the bipolar system of the Cold War era was replaced uh, uh, with a unipolar system. In the 1990s, many structural realists expected that states like Japan, Germany, Russia, and China uh, would pursue counterbalancing strategies against uh, the unipolar power to protect their own long-term independence. This did not happen during the first decade of the post-Cold War era. Instead, uh, the United States allies from the Cold War continued to cooperate with the United States uh, according to researchers focusing on the distribution of military power and especially uh, capacities for global power projection, the United States is still the sole superpower and the international system is still a unipolar system. However, as mentioned in a presentation of this panel, uh, some major actors have began to balance against the United States during the first two decades of the 21st century. To understand why some states continue to, to support the United States while others have started to balance against the United States, we need a broader conception of world order than the one presented by structural realists. Our transition theory and hegemonic stability theory uh, are two theoretical perspectives that um, can help us to explain these different responses. According to these perspectives, uh, power in the international system is exercised through institutions based on common values and ideas relating to a particular world order created by the dominating state, the hegemon. The present uh, US-led uh, liberal world order finds its roots in the early Cold War era when the Bretton Woods system was set up with institutions such as the International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Bank, uh, the GATT agreements that eventually uh, developed into World Trade Organization. The countries participating with these institutions during the Cold War belong to Western trade area known as the OECD uh, area. Uh, Sweden was in spite of her peacetime policy of neutrality, also a member of this Western community. This co Unity was held together not by force or domination, but by consensus, mutual interest, common values such as democracy, rule of law, rule of law in the war, uh, free market economy, uh, and an acceptance of the principle of civil liberties and rights. Uh, these values and norms um, are also common to both the European Union and NATO. In Europe, these norms and values were in the early post. Cold War era, 
further supported by a European security architecture with institutions such as Partnership for Peace, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and the Council of Europe. States that are generally supportive of these institutions and values have an interest in protecting the present multilateral liberal order and thereby becoming protectors of status quo. States or governments that do not perceive that their own state or their domestic power position benefit from this particular set of values and norms are more likely to pursue uh, revisionist strategies and counterbalancing strategies to protect their own autonomy or even overthrowing the existing order. The stability of world order is mainly affected by the balance of power between these status quo powers and the challenging revisionist states. This balance in turn is affected by the internal cohesion within which camp. So um, how have the war in Ukraine affected the stability of the US-led liberal world order and European security architecture? Russia's annexation of the Crimean Insula, its the demands for the re-establishment of its former squares of influence and a full-scale invasion of Ukraine are, of course, fundamental challenges to the security, European security order that was established in the early uh, Cold War era. This act also means uh, a final blow uh, to the ideas of Europe having entering a new area of perpetual peace. However, uh, the responses from uh, the member states of the European Union and NATO have so far shown a great deal of cohesion and unity with remarkable changes in policies from countries such as Germany, Finland, and Sweden. Maybe the present war will also serve as a reminder of the need to protect the values taken for granted during the end of history era in the 90s. In the long run, the final outcome of this challenge to a liberal, peaceful world order will be determined by the status quo power's ability to remain united. And since the present system is a unipolar system, the United States support and ability to keep the lines between status quo powers intact is a crucial factor for success. Thank you, Jacob, for this first overview. Um, I'll hand the floor to, to Shell Engelbright. Well, thank you, and thank you very much for showing up. The weather is wonderful here in Stockholm, so I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm quite impressed with 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 you all. Um, and, and thank you, Jakob, for setting this up uh, in terms of a kind of an analytical framework. Um, I, I'm not going to take issue with the analytical framework, the the um, which is somewhere in between realism and and a liberal uh, vantage point, or perhaps a mitigated realism vantage point, uh, but rather with the, 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 the uh, conclusion that you made when it comes to uh, what the Ukraine uh, war means for the world order. It seems to me that when uh, we talk uh, with other Europeans about what we're seeing in terms of um, uh, a response to, to uh, the aggression of, of the Russian Federation in, in, in Ukraine. Um, our, our view is a bit warped, I think. I think we're looking mostly at other Europeans. We're looking at other people who belong to this constituency of liberal democracies. And I think we're, we're, we're not paying enough attention, I think, to what's going on outside of, of the transatlantic community, the EU, uh, the G7, and perhaps the OECD countries. I mean, that's as far as I think I would, I would extend. And um, it, it, when we look beyond um, the uh, OECD countries, I'm not so sure that you see this uh, response in terms of uh, people and governments showing solidarity for Ukraine and, and, and distancing themselves from the uh, Russian Federation and, it, and its actions. Um, and uh, if we, if we, uh, even if we go back to this vote in the UN General Assembly from 2nd March, I, I think uh, it's important to look at the realities. 
you certainly did have 141 countries uh, asking for uh, the immediate uh, and un unconditional um, uh, retreat uh, of uh, the Russian forces from uh, Ukraine, and you only had um, uh, five countries supporting uh, Russian aggression uh, explicitly. Uh, but you also had 35 countries abstaining from voting, and you had 12, as far as I know, no shows uh, in the UN uh, in the uh, in the UN uh, General Assembly. Uh, but also, when you look at the countries that either abstained uh, or were no shows, um, you will find countries like the People's Republic of China. You will find countries like India, and suddenly you realize that more than half of humanity is actually not on board with uh, this solidarity with, with Ukraine. And uh, uh, if we now move to the uh, vote in the UN uh, Human Rights Council uh, in uh, early April, that is two, uh, uh, a month after the, the vote in the General Assembly, uh, you have 93 countries voting in favor of suspending a Russian just participation in the UN uh, uh, Human Rights Council, 24 against, and as many as 76 either abstending or, 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 or not showing up. So if anything, the commitment uh, to upholding the basic principles of the UN Charter and uh, for sovereignty, territorial integrity, human rights, and so on and so forth, seem rather to be lessening than strengthening over, over time. Um, uh, in terms of if you if you also go beyond the EU, uh, NATO, uh, the G7, and uh, the OECD, and look at the G20, if you look at the Shanghai Cooperation Council, the, the African Union, the ASEAN, uh, and so on and so forth, even the Quad, so which was supposed to be this uh, democratic bulwark against China in in the Asia Pacific, right? It's the United States, Australia, Japan, and India. Uh, India is also a bit of a no-show here. It doesn't uh, express criticism directly of, of, of Russia's action. So uh, my message would be that we have to be a bit cautious about uh, uh, talking about uh, the overwhelming support in terms of supporting uh, the rules-based liberal international order, uh, because there are a number of countries out there who are not uh, participating in this. And it seems to me that part of the explanation is the kind of diplomacy that Russia has been engaging with over a number of years, especially in the BRICS uh, group. Neither of the countries, I mean, uh, you have Brazil, South Africa, uh, 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 as well as India and, and China, have come out against Russia. Uh, Brazil has declared itself neutral, and, and uh, South Africa has even criticized Ukraine uh, and NATO for helping to precipitate uh, this conflict. So um, uh, it may be, as Jakob put it, that we are seeing uh, a strengthening of the um, solidarity and, and uh, rules-based order within the transatlantic community, perhaps as far as, as the OECD community, but I'm not so sure when it comes to the, 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 the global or, uh, uh, security order. Thank you, Shell. Um, last but not least, Paulina Britz. Thank you. Um, I will shift focus a little bit from, from both the, uh, well, from the, the larger world order and turn towards Europe a little bit. And I will speak about, well, there's a lot of talk about NATO in Sweden these days, but I will start to talk a little bit about the EU. And I think later on we will have we can have a very interesting discussion about what what Shell uh, um, just pointed out that there is actually a well there, there, there some something is going on here where we have a strength in EU and a strength in NATO and the weakened UN and I think that is an interesting thing we can talk about later on. But I will talk a little bit about how how the um, Ukraine war has. Um, how the EU has has shown its uh, strength in, in the Ukraine war, and also a little bit about NATO. Um, I mean, EU is EU is a, a traditionally sort of a soft power in the sense that it has historically created security through economy rather than military um, measures, 
but it has increased its uh, possibilities in the last years to act as a, to be an actor also in matters of security and defense. It has for quite some time had a, a common security, uh, secure, foreign and security policy, but the defense aspects have, have become stronger, and especially after 2016, where the EU uh, uh, presented a, 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 a sort of a global, uh, a global strategy. Um, and, and what we can see in the war in Ukraine is that a lot of the measures that the EU has worked on and, and sort of tools in security and defense that it has worked to build up uh, in the last years, they have come into to practice actually now uh, during the war in Ukraine, both with regard to foreign policy, but also with regard to defense. Uh, for example, the EU has so far um, taken five sanction packages um, where they, all the member states have agreed. Um, and they, they cover areas such as trade, energy supplies, though not yet oil, and banking in relation to Russia. The EU has also used a fairly new instrument, which is called the European Peace Facility, uh, where it now has put aside 2 billion euro um, to reimburse member states who donate arms to Ukraine. And the EU, as late as yesterday, if I remember correctly, so I'm sorry if things are happening so quickly in the political world now, so it's difficult sometimes to keep track, but I think it was as late as yesterday, the EU actually posed a clear um, membership perspective for Ukraine, in that the Commission proposed a 9 billion euro loan for the, the Ukraine to pursue important state functions now during the war. Um, but at the same time as pos posing this loan, um, uh, posing demands on Ukraine to continue its reforms, to get the, to terms with corruption in order to, to be prepared for EU membership in the future. So here, here you can see a clear sort of path for the Ukrainian future towards EU membership. So these are things that the EU has done in, in, in terms of foreign policy, and security policy and, um, and, and except of this, of course, the EU has a number of instruments of a more civilian character. It has used its civil protection me mechanism to, to provide um, civilian support and money for, for Ukraine. And a lot, I mean, the, the general idea when, when the Ukraine war started was that people were a bit insecure whether the EU would actually manage to, to be so determined then and keep cohesion. And I think one aspect here in the development of the EU that is interesting when you, you use instruments such as the European Peace Facility is that it, it, it's an instrument that is used on an EU level. It's not up to member state veto, which means that member states who might be a bit hesitant um, to, to support some of the um, things that the EU wants to do, um, for example, Hungary, they still have to pay because they pay money to this fund. Uh, so it means that you, the EU now has started to use some of its um, supranational um, tools for security and defense policy. Uh, in addition to this, the EU NATO relationship has increased in the last years. And this has also been shown in the war. The EU NATO relationship has increased spe specifically in, since 2016. It's been ongoing, of course, for a long time since a lot of the EU members also are members of NATO, but, but sort of a, as an official policy, there have been joint declarations both in 2016 and 2018 to clarify the relationship between, between the EU and NATO. And this was further that um, clarify this year in, in, in the an EU document called the Strategic Compass, which is one of the new tools that the EU uses to, to show its, um, well, the future policy of, of, of its uh, actions in security and defense. And for example, in, in, the, in the Security Compass and uh, EU points at um, things such as um, shared situational awareness as an important um, 
common thing to do and to share scenarios and have exercises together, uh, both parallel and joint exercises, and to include an aspect of the development in EU that I think is particularly interesting since 2016, which is the military mobility, where the EU um, takes, takes away rules that or, or national regulations that might hinder military mobility between EU member states. Of course, from my perspective, the EU so far has, well, well, up until now, it has mostly created capacities uh, or increase the creation of capacities, and they were always, always to be used outside of the EU and never inside of the EU. If you compare to NATO, which is an organization that has worked with territorial defense, the EU has never really done that. But, but uh, talking of things like military mobility between EU member states, then you sort of start to touch upon issues such as territorial defense. And a very concrete output of this cooperation then is that in the just yesterday the when the ministers of defense met in the eu uh, they were um, they also had company of the deputy secretary general of uh, the nato as well as the ukraine defense minister so this is just to show how the eu is um, working and in order to to um, um, to use its the capacities it has uh, in this war uh, without actually participating in the war, but supporting the other organizations and, and the Ukraine government. How much time do I have? Okay, <laughs> I just have one final point. Um, something that that is uh, um, um, fascinating. Then, if you if we move back a little bit to the discussion we have had in Sweden uh, these last couple of weeks with the Swedish Finnish membership. Uh, if it happens in NATO, uh, as you know, the jury is out, so we don't know whether Sweden and Finland will join yet, but the application has been sent in. Uh, and looking at this, it, from my perspective, then the Swedish and Finnish, a, if it happens, then the Swedish and Finnish membership in NATO might actually make it easy for the EU to become an actor in defense, um, because it will increase the number of EU member states who are also members of NATO, which means that the, the cooperation between the organizations obviously will be even easier. And one, but it, it sort of also highlights an interesting aspect of the EU because so far when, when the EU has developed, the, especially the capacity building that has taken place since 2016, um, the, uh, the organization has worked to facilitate uh, increased levels of both military and civilian, but in particular military capacities and capabilities for the member states, for example, by creating a European defense fund where you can get money to, to do research or to develop new arms programs, for example. But it, it also shows that the EU hasn't really decided what these, why, why it's doing this. Is it only to help member states to um, it sort of lacks a clear direction from the member states on whether this is done in order to increase member state capacities and thereby strengthening sort of a common sense of security, or whether it does it to become a, a, a provider of security in itself, sort of the organization's identity, uh, and, and be an actor not only in foreign, foreign, foreign policy and security in a general sense, but actually become an, an actor in defense policy. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, well, in, in my first question, I'm going to try and pull on some of these different strands. Um, one of the things that, of course, has been one of the features of the last few months is uh, this dramatic and perhaps unexpected to some extent rallying of the West. Um, the response to the invasion of Ukraine has prompted uh, coordinated measures and actions in the diplomatic sphere, in the security domain, um, and the imposition of economic sanctions on the scale that I think few people anticipated. Um, and all of that, of course, has been facilitated by uh, the fact that the Russian campaign has been quite disastrous. It really has underperformed quite dramatically compared to what most analysts expected. So everything feels quite rosy, perhaps, from, from this point of view. Uh, but the question I, I suppose I would have is whether this rallying of the West is to be seen as, a, as an endorsement of 
the international world order per se, that it's a reinforcement of global norms, liberal norms that uh, the rest of the world uh, will, will, will uh, continue to abide by uh, and support, or, or whether this strengthening uh, or coming together of the West is itself only part of the formation of uh, a multipolar, multipolar polar order, that we've got a number of states now that stand outside uh, the world order, at least in an ambivalent, uh, the liberal world order, that is, uh, stand, uh, at the very least in an ambivalent fashion. And we have, of course, Russia, when we can't really see, foresee at this point when Russia would, will be reintegrated uh, into uh, the dominant world order, when relations might be normalized, it seems to be impossible so long as, as uh, Putin is a leader there, but, but even, even a change of the leadership of the state would, would probably involve Western countries have to, to close their eyes to the reality of what the, the regime remains. Um, we have, of course, as Shell pointed out, India, who's quite ambivalent here, uh, in, perhaps on some level, um, due to its status as a democracy, uh, some shared values, but nonetheless reluctant to endorse fully what is, what is happening. Um, and then, of course, most importantly, perhaps of all, is China, um, which um, has been in a situation of tension with Western states for, for some time and who has recently got much closer to, to Russia. And so we have the prospect of, a, of an alliance or proximity between those two states uh, in a world that would be increasingly divided. So again, to, to sum up, well, what, how should we see the kind of response from the West here? Is this really the world order uh, the liberal world order finding a uh, new new uh, a new wind after uh, it has to be said probably a decade in which it has uh, uh, suffered considerably or are we actually just further down this road of the, the, the world uh, the singular kind of world order that we thought was emerging after the cold war uh, giving way to something that will see different centers of power uh, perhaps different normative orders Jakob, do you wanna I, I, so i can start um, yeah, uh, to, to partly reply to, to Shell's comments as well then, um, this um, um, perhaps a re-emerge of support for, for li liberal values taken for granted, how much does it transcend outside the, the its traditional home area uh, from, from the Cold War the o OCD uh, era? And um, <clears throat> how much of a concern is, is what's happening right now to in uh, Ukraine for the rest of, of the world? Um, I, I would say that uh, uh, this um, rallying uh, uh, um, or coming together uh, or rebirth of, of enthusiasm for traditional liberal values is mainly something that I see myself in the context of the doubts we have had within this area, uh, 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 within the European Union and with Trump within the United States, uh, that it is uh, this um, um, transatlantic uh, Western communities lack of faith or lack of care for, for their own fundamental values that we, we, we saw uh, some year ago. And that is what I hope to see to see changing. So I think that we have this sort of um, remnant from, from, from the um, uh, Cold War area, the differences between the advanced economies and the developing world. Well, obviously they haven't been transcended. Uh, so, so parts of these um, new expanding economies or previously expanding economies like uh, Brazil, uh, India and so on, uh, they view themselves as, as a different kind of states that have problem with the sort of free trade regime of the Bretton Woods uh, community because they they're, they're, they have difficulties in competing on, on these terms. Uh, together with Håkan Edström, I, I did a study a couple of years ago, uh, two years ago, on uh, middle powers, and we, we rather quickly had to differentiate between emergent middle powers, that is states like Brazil, uh, uh, South Africa, uh, India, and so on, and the traditional middle powers belonging to this, this, this Western community. And that is not only a transatlantic community, it also includes Australia, Japan, South, South Korea, and so on. So of course, these, these uh, divisions are also uh, uh, present, but, but uh, I, 
in my optimistic scenario, I hope that 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 the West will collect the faith in itself. And this also relates to, to soft power, uh, as mentioned by, by Malena. Uh, if we follow the definition of, of um, Joseph Nye, soft power is a sort of ability to influence other actors by attraction, by uh, other actors wanting to be as we. Uh, in, our, in our own uh, European context, uh, this is often exemplified by uh, the formerly com communist countries uh, in Eastern Europe running to the European Union to um, take part of uh, the sort of good life, the welfare, uh, the freedom, and perhaps even the democratic uh, governance of the European Union. Um, then they also, of course, uh, ran to NATO, and that was probably <laughs> more related to, to, to the need uh, to, to get se uh, security. Um, the, do today's European Union have the same ability to uh, track? Well, there are still a, a number of states that, that wants to join us, but in a way, we, we don't have this kind of enthusiasm that, 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 that you may have expected in, in the 90s for this project of uniting Europe, uh, 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 overcoming the divisions from, from Yalta and, uh, and the Cold War, War area. Um, was another thing I was thinking. Yes, what what should the European do? A European Union do to to promote um, uh, security? And what will happen if it's Sweden and Finland joins the European Union when it comes to European Union defense capabilities? Uh, during the the Cold War era, there was a very efficient division of, of labor between uh, NATO and, and the European Union. That uh, and NATO, of course, uh, uh, was an instrument of containment. Uh, to prevent uh, Russia and its allies uh, to expand further in, in, in the Euro-Atlantic or in the transatlantic uh, European era. Um, the European Union, on, on uh, the other hand, was an instrument to keep the peace between the member states, primarily uh, between Germany and France. So instead of creating security by de deterrence, uh, the European Union was for to create security through integration. Um, what happened in, in the 90s when we entered this new world with expectation of uh, in, uh, a war between states in Europe being a thing of the past, with the exception for the, for the Balkans, of course, was that both these organizations started to change themselves to become useful in the new security environment. So, so the European Union started to have ambitions also when it came to international crisis management, just as uh, uh, NATO. The NATO started to have ambitions regarding pay, uh, partnership with a PFP co cooperation, just as a sort of an, in, an integrated logic. What to do now if we are back in, in, in a Europe where we could expect new wars between states? Should we go back to our own uh, old division of level or do something different. And I think actually uh, along the lines that Malena spoke, that I think we should do something partly different. I think what is needed uh, for the decades to come is a strengthening of the European pillar within NATO so that we don't have to rely on uh, American voters uh, voting for the right uh, ca candidate. And, and in addition to this, I think uh, Trump and before him, Obama was perfectly uh, right, saying that uh, America doesn't have any permanent war debt towards Europe, that they, they have to keep the forces here, 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 here for eternity. Uh, 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 Europe must take a great responsibility for its own safety when it comes to conventional assets. Yes, I, yes I, I mean, I, I think we can definitely see a sort of differentiation here in normative world orders, if you could say, where, where, the EU, where Europe, uh, um, both EU and NATO, sticks out a little bit. And I, I think that the war in Ukraine has shown that the EU can act on its values, but it's a really interesting question to ask whether it can extend those values and project them. I mean, it's, as Jakob talked about, the soft power, it, it has been an ambition for quite some time, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm sort of thinking about how how successful that has been, really. And as I 
said and, and relating to what Shell said, it's interesting to discuss then the relationship between the EU NATO and the weakened UN because also NATO and, and the EU, they build on the idea of, of the UN is sort of a, as I see it, a, a sort of structural basis for how these organizations work and, and sort of the whole idea of a rule-based uh, international order. So maybe I, I'm, I'm going to <laughs> give, give, the, give the ball to Shell here to, to, to comment a bit on how we can see sort of the, the relationship between strengths and regional organization and weak and global. Right. Uh, yeah, it's not, that's not a, a, a narrow issue. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I can certainly see how the transatlantic community and the EU, but perhaps especially um, uh, NATO Europe, <laughs> uh, forging much more of a, a, a bulwark for this part of the world, and perhaps also uh, assisting to prop up, I mean, part part of the rules based uh, uh, world order, and I think uh, you mentioned the military mobility um, uh, uh, initiative on the part of the European Union. I, I don't think it's important for the EU, but I think it's important for NATO Europe because you can have NATO deployment much more easily, and and so so that gives it much more credibility. And that, that I, I think, but uh, uh, in, in terms of um, the interlinkages between uh, the European Union, NATO, and uh, the UN as a, an umbrella organization and, and the UN Charter. Um, I can imagine that we will still have this kind of um, uh, international legal infrastructure, but at the same time have a, a much more disintegrated world, which is the one that I'm talking about here. Again, just to go back to this notion, I think uh, Antoine mentioned the sanctions regime, for instance. The sanctions uh, regime is very much driven by the transatlantic community, and uh, it is very much a, an optical illusion that the sanctions are being supported by other countries because they are would be affected by second order uh, 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 sanctions by the United States in particular if they were to completely divert from what is being prescribed by, by the United States and, and to some extent the, the European Union. So in, in that sense, again, I, I think that um, uh, we, we would uh, see much less of, um, uh, if it weren't for the, the economic especially, but also political and, and military leverage on the part of the United States and, and the transatlantic community, we would see uh, a lot more of deviations from the sanctions re regime. We're seeing some of it from, from India, certainly. Uh, we're seeing some of it from, from China, but they still haven't confronted really. I mean, if the, if, if the Chinese decided to, they could probably offset a big chunk of the sanctions, the, 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 uh, the, the problems that the sanctions are uh, uh, causing Russia, but they haven't chosen to do that yet. Uh, and perhaps if we were in a different situation in 10 or 20 years from now, when the situation probably will be more multipolar to use the terminology that Jakob introduced, uh, you could perhaps envisage that you would have that kind of uh, confrontation. But, but the I, I, I'm not saying, I'm not having a kind of teleological <laughs> logic completely um, introduced here. I don't think that it's a given that we're moving um, toward this multipolarity that would in, in me, uh, imply a, a, the rules-based order uh, being uh, uh, undermined gradually and eroded over the next few years and, and, and decades. I still see that there are also ways in which the West will be trying to integrate part of the non-West. One example is that the US just lifted a number of uh, sanctions vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela uh, just the other day. Uh, and Venezuela has sided very much with, with the Russians with their oil and fossil fuel industry. Now uh, the, the Venezuelans are, are seeing an opportunity to reconnect to the United States and to the US economy, which would be very beneficial for it uh, in terms of prospects for prosperity. 
And here I can also uh, imagine that, that if uh, Russia uh, continues to weaken, not just militarily, but economically, it will also weaken politically. And it will be less attractive, I think, as, as, as this alternate, the, the alternative power center uh, in, in the world. And that will also then diminish perhaps the attraction for the other BRICS countries to, to look to Russia. I mean, Russia very much initiated this uh, move toward multipolarity in, 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 in international diplomacy, but also in terms of being um, uh, effective in terms of its information uh, and disinformation uh, campaigns that has been going on. Um, it, it was striking to me to look at the uh, half of the countries that abstended from, uh, from voting in the General Assembly vote that I referred to previously were African. And uh, it's been, to I've been told that it's very much because uh, both social media and, and media such as Russia Today and Sputnik are quite influential in, in that part of, of the world. And, and uh, if, if uh, uh, the, the Russian model and, and Russia becomes less uh, attractive, I think, to some of these uh, developing countries, that will also change the calculus for them. And some of them may also be uh, then uh, less inclined to jump on the anti-West bandwagon. So I, I think what, what we're seeing is a lot of things shifting right now, uh, uh, but I, I just want to caution on the side of uh, just don't believing that, that there's that much solidarity for Ukraine and the reverse for, for, for Russia out there in the, in, in, in the world as, as a whole. I don't think that is happening at, at this very point in time. Uh, Michelle, I think you're very right to point out um, that the, the future is not written, that we are probably at a period of great contingency and it, it would take just a few events to put us again on a different trajectory. And the evidence of, a th of this, I think, is how things have turned around so quickly. When we think, for example, about NATO a few years ago, uh, President Trump was doubting the validity of the existence of NATO. President Macron was saying that the institution was brain dead. Uh, and now suddenly we have new members knocking on the door, uh, um, defense budgets up across the continent. Germany is seemingly doing a, a volte face in terms of its, its defense policy and its foreign policy. So that's all very dramatic. But the, the, the risk here is to take those very short term trends as being indicative of uh, a general direction of travel. The, the risk here being that we suddenly see this unity in the West as having just papered over the problems that we've seen for the last 10, 10 20 years or so. Um, you know, the, the, the Trump presidency you know, has gone, but Trump has not gone, and the underlying political divides in the US have not gone. There's a much wider malaise across the West um, in the face of economic inequality. Uh, consensus has kind of broken down over the economic system, the neoliberal economic system that was triumphant in immediate uh, post-Cold War clearly is no longer uh, widely or consensual. Uh, and we have populism. Uh, and we should just remember just last month that the far right candidate in France obtained 43% of the vote. And you know, had she won the election, we might be looking at a very different, different situation indeed. So I, I suppose the, the question I have for you here is, is if we're thinking about soft power and values and, and the West, uh, you know, how have current events changed some of these fundamental fault lines? Um, it, is this, uh, has this to be seen as kind of a short-term rallying that could easily come unpicked? Because really, in many ways, Western countries have not dealt with the political, or resolved the political divides that have been tearing them apart uh, for in, in recent years and have destabilized institutions like the, the EU um, and, and its purpose. It's quite an open-ended question. I don't know how you, you want to tackle that. Go on. I don't know. <clears throat> Uh, this kind of, um, shall we call it, neo-nationalism or, or something that, uh, that um, unite uh, a lot of different um, critics of the liberal ideas. Uh, uh, actors like, uh, 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 well, uh, Putin's Russia. Um, until recently, at least, uh, 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 the Polish government, uh, Orban, 
but also uh, uh, other actors outside Europe, for instance, um, France and um, uh, part of the reason of, uh, for, for Brexit may also be, be, be related to this. Um, what I think it is, is that the globalization has produced real cleavages in uh, uh, a lot of societies. And, and that relates to the production industry where uh, goods are nowadays being produced in China and other places far away from North America and Europe. Uh, so there are, there are there are people who who actually are are being worse off. And I think this is extremely important in, in to understand Trump's success, uh, for instance, and he also promised to bring the gold, good old American graffiti back, just as uh, uh, the Brexiteers uh, wanted to bring the the Empire and Commonwealth back as an alternative to to Europe. So. What they are doing here, and the same goes for Putin and, and his, his uh, support for the, the Orthodox Church, is that they are trying to create a sort of unity based on old national values. Uh, and they are rather su successful because there is a market from it where, when, when people feel uh, 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 that they've lost a sense of belonging. Um, and if we look at Sweden, for instance, what, what, what was Sweden? Uh, 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 in the du, 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 during the Cold War, where we were a society that was partly engaged in building this ever uh, 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 more perfect welfare model, uh, 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 who was coined the, the idea of the, the people's home, and it, and it was a particular national welfare project, or originally a social de democratic welfare uh, uh, project that sort of united uh, uh, Sweden behind a common cause. And when we ask ourselves, well, what are our place in, in the world? Well, we were the neutral Sweden. So, so we had a sort of a rather clear political identity that could form the basis for a community. Uh, but uh, economic crisis in the 70s and the 80s convinced the social democratic government that they could no longer pursue this uh, national welfare project as, as a uh, national project. Uh, we will have to enter the European Union to rebuild uh, the people's home on a, on a European level, uh, the then uh, 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 social democratic leader Ingmar Karlsson argued. Uh, he thought that he could take uh, uh, Sweden's policy of ne neutrality with him uh, uh, on, on the plane to Brussels, uh, and uh, uh, he seemed to succeed somehow. There, there wasn't much uh, discussions on Sweden losing that part of identity until we now ha ha have had a situation, this discussion on NATO membership that, that will end this part of identity as well. The problem as I see it is that we haven't managed to create this sort of greater European identity that could replace the lost national identities. Uh, so there is a lack of, you could say, soft power. How lovely it is to be European. Yes, but what is <laughs> European? There's not many people feeling that way. Uh, there's not many people who cares about what are the European levels of unemployment rates, for instance. Uh, we are still focusing our attention to, to what, what happens in, in the nation, but we no, no longer recognize ourselves in the nation. So that is a sort of loss of, of collective identity that makes it easy for, for certain uh, new nationalistic forces to exploit this for their own program. Well, I, I think it will be uh, from this, um, it will be, um, how could I say this in a way not to sound uh, strange, but interesting to see the full um, implications of Brexit, actually. We, we haven't seen them yet. Um, we have seen parts of it. Uh, there are difficulties now between the EU and the UK with regards to Northern Ireland, for example. Um, we don't really yet know exactly. And then the Ukraine, there was a pandemic and then the Ukraine war. So we haven't really seen the full extent of, of or the consequences actually of Brexit. But um, I guess that that will sort of be a lesson for um, other countries in Europe, thinking in terms of trying to distance themselves in ways uh, that, you know, in, in, along the lines that Jakob mentioned, because so far, the UK hasn't been better off. Um, 
and 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 we we will see a little bit how that how that works out actually after uh, now there have been other crises and things to deal with but we can see some of these conflicts are popping up that that will be really difficult and that ha they have to be handled uh, by the national politicians um, so you can't but because what happens when you when you exit the EU, you can't know, you can't any longer. What I'm thinking is that when you exit the EU, you can't blame the EU for your difficulties anymore. So you have to sort of take responsibility for them. And, and that responsibility, we haven't seen yet how it will be taken care of because there has been a, a pandemic and now with the war. So, but somehow along the line, at the end of the road, you have to, to take care of those consequences nationally, because who should you blame? when you're not a member of the EU anymore. You may be a bit overly optimistic about, <laughs> about British Brexiters. Um, British Bre Brexiters, I think, are capable of blaming the EU for a long, long time, <laughs> even when the UK will have left or has left. So. Yeah, yeah, but I, I guess if you ask people and if you do a poll in five years or something and, and ask them bluntly, uh, did the UK take back control, for instance, that would be very interesting to see if people feel that the UK did take back control or, or not, because the criticism we've seen against the, the, the EU for, for, uh, for decades really, is that the scope for politics is, a, is being constrained by uh, a number of EU uh, directives and regulations and, and, and laws and regulations that, that uh, limit uh, the, 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 the scope for politics. And that's where you get the establishment politics on the one side and the anti-establishment on the other side on the, on the other side and we've seen uh, a proliferation of a relatively problematic kind in the last uh, last uh, decade or so with what uh, Gideon Rachman now of the Financial Times called strongman politics right that 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 you have individuals acting as autocrats even within the scope of a democratic system uh, like in Hungary and certainly in Tur Turkey um, and and uh, that's uh, that's an alternative to to the regular politics. Then then becomes really a, a problem. I mean, to the extent that 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 goes to the populism that you were talking about. But but it's it's a it's a kind of tall, uh, 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 of populism that also is is really eroding. I think uh, uh, democratic uh, norms more more generally. Uh, it would be what, what we're lacking right now. I think is on the on the left, perhaps uh, a, a, a more a challenge that would be perhaps less uh, fundamentally challenge uh, uh, to to the to the overall structure, but but would still uh, 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 create momentum, political momentum on the on the part of the young people, people who want. Uh, perhaps a greener economy and things like that, but we haven't really seen that. The the the, the main challenge we've seen on the right, and that has uh, to some extent also resonated with uh, people who've been siding with the authoritarianism that we've seen with with Putin. Uh, I, I think it's far too early to say where all this will land. We we still don't have a decisive victory for anybody in Ukraine. Uh, uh, and what it means for European politics and the European security order. Uh, but I think there are a couple of tentative lessons. One is perhaps that, that uh, even liberal norms need to be underwritten by hard power eventually. So that's why I think uh, this uh, lesson that defense uh, expenditures need to be higher in the European countries is I, I think will be more lasting. I think that's that's a lesson that will be more lasting. Um, I, I'm, I'm a lot less sure what it means for the political landscape of, of Europe, uh, 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 but I can imagine that uh, uh, at least for some, uh, this uh, the strongman model uh, will be um, will be uh, delegitimized. Uh, uh, but certainly not for 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 all, uh, because it does present a, a more, I think, a fundamental challenge. Um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to um, uh, the information 
domain, and we haven't really gotten into this yet, but I think it's really important to think about how uh, politics, national and European, is being refracted through the new media landscape. Uh, I think uh, a lot of things need to be managed in order for politics to be less disruptive than it has been in, in, the, in the, the, the last couple of years. And uh, part of that is probably the European Union trying to weigh down on Google and Facebook and others to manage the systems uh, a bit more so that you will have algorithms that will uh, less promotes the, the, the extremism of, of politics, but, but part of it is probably also trying to, uh, to re-engage uh, the politics of Europe, and, and especially, I think, young people uh, who, who, I think, uh, uh, otherwise tend to be uh, alienated from, 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 uh, from the, the, the future. But um, again, we're, 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 we're speculating quite a lot here because I think I think uh, the future is certainly not written, and there are so many things going on at the same time here. So, exactly how they will pan out depends on uh, a number of things. I think are moving now, and perhaps we'd be in a better position just in six or twelve months to 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 see more of clear paths through through this. Well, then, and then we'll open up to the audience. Yes. No. No. I just have a comment on, on the economy. The side of economics, because I think that one thing that you mentioned a little bit, the, the sort of the increased budgets for defense in European countries and the, the costs of militarization. Uh, I think that we will, I mean, now we have just come, to, come out of a pandemic where a lot of the uh, European states have had to, to uh, increase, the, uh, increase their, their spending, the state spending, to um, ameliorate the, the effects of the pandemic. And now they will have to increase state spending, both with regard to, to increased defense budgets, but also to ameliorate consequences of, of, of war with increased um, uh, prices on, on food and other things, um, and, uh, electricity and, 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 and things like that. So we, I think that we will have a quite harsh discussion on economic issues in all the e e European states. Uh, on, on, on sort of budget, on priorities. And then I think maybe the, what you discussed a little bit, the, the sort of the left and the ecological movement that at the moment are really quiet, uh, they, they will be, have higher voices. And we saw it actually a little bit also in the French elections because the, um, the left, I mean, it's, it has to do with the, how, how the, the elections, how, how they do it, but, but they were not that far away actually from from the race in, in, in the presidential elections in France. So, so I think that there will be quite more ideological discussions with regard to economy and, and, and public spending uh, as a consequence also. Okay, let's, let's see if we've got more questions from the audience. There's one over there. Thank you. Can you introduce yourself, please? My name is Paul Branger. I'm a professor of public international law at Stockholm University. Thank you very much for the interesting discussion. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is regarding um, uh, world order, or in particular, the liberal world order. I think that the provision on the use of force or on aggression, or non-intervention, so that provision is not really part of the liberal world order. It's a global, it's a global norm. Uh, and it's uh, particularly cherished by small states in the third world, of course, historically speaking. So, but I'm thinking that, um, you know, that, that there might be another sort of distinction in the view of the use of force and intervention. And that is between sovereignists and states that have a more imperial outlook. And it's clear, of course, that Russia has that, that kind of outlook. Uh, Ukraine in its, is in itself backyard within its sphere of interest. And I understand that the Chinese, you know, with their long history of uh, more than 2,000 years of an empire also think a little bit in that way. And of course, we have the US with, it, with its Monroe Doctrine and the Roosevelt Corollary, which is perhaps not as enforced now as it, as it used to be. So um, that's my question to the panel, whether you see a difference in views regarding the 
the use of force and aggression between um, imperial or imperial minded states and other states. So that's my first question. The second question uh, is that uh, it seems that the political costs of this invasion were much higher than Putin had imagined. I, I think that's almost a truism. Uh, and I think one consequence, and, uh, and, uh, and a fortunate consequence, I think, of, of these events is that a machinery, political and administrative machinery has been tested and seems to work quite fine. I'm thinking of, uh, first of all, of war crimes investigations. This is not new, but the network or, or the um, cooperation between uh, actors at different levels from NGOs up to states, many states involved and the International Criminal Court, I think is quite interesting and might have a deterrent effect in the future. And then of course, the sanctions. Uh, sanctions of the nature that have been opposed, imposed are not new, but uh, strength and the, uh, the speed and, and so forth, I think was unexpected against, after all, a permanent member of the Security Council and the nuclear power. So, um, uh, this and the sanctions have been uh, directed, of course, against uh, various Russian actors, but also, I mean, state actors, but also against the oligarchs. And I think that uh, people are now asking questions about, you know, ill begotten gains by oligarchs from other countries than Russia, we might have sort of a knock on effect here. But anyway, my core question is here is whether you think that the, the sort of uh, the exercise of this machinery might have also a deterrent effect in the future. Thank you. Two questions here, one on the norm of sovereignty and, and one on the potential deterrent effect of the various mechanisms that were deployed, have been deployed against Russia, notably sanctions. Who wants to take these on, or, or one of them, as you wish? Shell. Well, let's start with the uh, war crimes and sanctions issue. I mean, we don't have the ex expertise that you have, and some of our colleagues have, uh, when it comes to international law. But, uh, but, um, I, I'm sh I'm quite sure that that the goalpost will be moved uh, forward here. I, I uh, and we also see what technology can do. The 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 GPS system, you, you geolocate some of these things, and it happens only within a couple of weeks. You, you can know basically which tank shot on. I mean, uh, used. I mean, used force against a certain village, and you you, you can get pin things down in a way. So that will certainly uh, uh, increase the possibilities of bringing people to court, or at least threatening to do, to do it. I, I think that that's a, a huge advantage. Something that will that will uh, assist in the future. I though think that the, the aggression here was uh, quite extreme. It was so massive. It was so unprovoked. Everybody realized it was unprovoked. And I would, I would even say that in Putin's speech on the 21st of February, he didn't even deliver a justification. And not one that anybody, not, certainly not a legal scholar, can, can accept. So in that sense, I think this may be a deviation, I think, from other, uh, other uh, 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 examples of aggression, uh, where it's not as massive, not as asymmetric, and, and you don't even have a, a, a clear justification. I think even Russia has prided itself, I think, in the past of dressing up their actions in, in international law language very effectively. I mean, they have been on the UN Security Council as a veto member for, for, for a couple of generations. So they, they certainly uh, have very qualified lawyers. But I think that's the kind of caveat, I would say, that this is an untypical, I think, uh, example of aggression. But when it comes to the other things on, on, on war crimes, I think, yes, it it's opens up a whole host of opportunities, both to bring people eventually to, to, to a court somewhere, but also in terms of investigations that may also have a deterrent effect. Yeah, a few uh, re reflections on them, on, on the first issue on, on sovereignty and, and imperial fort and so on. Uh, I, th I think it is uh, a rather 
a difficult thing to answer how this relates to, to say, liberal theory. Uh, in, in, in America, there is these two sort of competing tradition. Uh, one, uh, I, 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 isolationist, uh, with its roots in the Monroe Doctrine from the early 19th century, saying that uh, 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 the US should only care about its only uh, Western hemisphere. But within that sphere, we should continue to be the only great power. Uh, so so uh, uh, that is one tradition. And that tradition isn't really a thing of the past. Uh, uh, there are uh, strong voices in the United States that are suggesting that they should pursue a uh, policy of offshore balancing, uh, letting uh, uh, the power politics in the world's different region play out by themselves and, and, and only entering conflict uh, at a later stage. Uh, then we have this, this other American uh, tradition, the Wilsonian tradition. Uh, uh, and that tradition saw its birth during the, the First World War where uh, 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 the President Woodrow Wilson uh, convinced the American Congress that the US should voluntarily enter the World World War. And as he motivated it, it was because the world needed to be safe for democracy. And his, his whole idea was that this old time European concept, great power politics, where small states were, small states were cut up like cheese should be a thing of the past. And that was the basic problem with peace, the secret alliances. So, so instead, uh, 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 the US should go in, it should determine the outcome of the First World War, and then we would create this system, uh, the League of, of Nations, a system that is based on the idea of every state's right to self-determination. And it also had these mutual guarantees, the collective security system, saying that if one of the members are attacked, uh, all other members should respond first uh, uh, by political sanctions, then by economic sanctions. And finally, if uh, 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 the Security Council so decides by, by military sanctions. And in addition to this, there was this package of uh, uh, um, this, this, this armament and various institutions for mediation and so on. That I would say is a sort of a, a liberal packet as a whole. But we have a darker side on, on this Wilsonian tra uh, uh, tradition as well. Uh, after 9-11, uh, uh, um, um, the, the then president George um, W. Bush uh, uh, presented his new uh, security strategy uh, and that it was uh, declared that uh, we are idealistic about our, our uh, goals, but we are realistic about the means to achieve them. So there we have the idea of, of spreading democracy through heavy military engagement. And the problem with this strategy, of course, became more and more obvious uh, 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 each year in Afghanistan and Iraq. And this is a very complicated thing. I, I would say uh, normative, uh, to what extent can we tolerate that sovereignty is used to deny uh, 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 citizens living in a state uh, uh, their rights? Uh, what responsibility do the sort of international community have to protect the lives of citizens? And that is the, the, the radical uh, uh, liberal uh, uh, in, in interpretation, I would say, the normative base for uh, responsibility to protect. But there are some values that are even more fundamental than state sovereignty, and that is human rights. So, so states that uh, 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 use their, their sovereignty to systematically uh, 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 make parts of their people, identifiable groups suffer, have lost their, 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 their sovereign rights and, and the, the, the international community should interact. But again, when the shit hits the fan and we implement this, this, this as it seemed to very moral solid idea, well then it could happen that, 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 that we have a situation as we had in Libya in 2011. 
Yes. Uh, just to say that, uh, just to add to the fact, if I may, of course, one of the things that's striking is that Russia has mobilized this kind of language yeah. and saying there's genocide in eastern Ukraine and sovereignty, yes. therefore, cannot be upheld. And they use, they use that argument in Georgia um, and so forth. So there's a boomerang effect here for the West. As... Yeah, I actually forgot Russia. I was say, saying a few words on it as well. That, that, that was why I started with the United States, so I, I could continue to say something about Russia. And, and of course, this uh, kind of imperialism that, uh, uh, that Russia uh, and, and its demands for its square of influence that, that was presented to uh, both the US and NATO in December last year, that, that, that is a, a totally different kind of moral arguing that is based on this old European concert view of the world or the old uh, 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 Vienna Congress uh, in, in 1815 view of the world. And that system gives only some states rights, the great powers, the small states only have to suffer. Briefly, sir. Perhaps just a footnote. I, I think the building empires in the kind of 19th or 18th or 19th century uh, 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 version of, of, of the thinking, I think is fairly anachronistic. I think it's it, I think it's a little unusual that that Russia keep keeps this idea. Uh, but what I think, and to some extent, of course, China holds it as well when it comes to Taiwan. Uh, uh, I would not mind being a fly on the wall in Beijing when they're discussing to what extent the Ukraine uh, war has made them think that they want to do something about Taiwan more quickly or they want to wait a while and build up. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's very fascinating, the, the analogy between the two. But I, I would rather think that great powers, to the extent that we're moving to, toward something a bit more polycentric, a uh, situation, then I think uh, major powers will want to project power into their neighborhoods. I think that is very difficult to, to stifle that trend. And that certainly also will have implications for international law. But it's not the same as building empires and conquering territories. I think that is a bit anachronistic. Melinda. No? Okay, great. We can take some more questions then. We have a question over there. Please introduce yourself. Uh, go on. No, no, okay. ah, no, it is. I'm uh, P. Olson. And okay, now. <laughs> and um, I have a smaller question. So, first, first thanks a lot for this. Uh, I'm a business developer and I'm not into this um, so much politicians and, um, and the defense. But what can you experts do to help engaging our teenagers? I have two teen teenagers. But before, before Ukraine, I mean, they didn't really think about defense. And I think the politicians, they are not able to engage the younger generation. So if you have any ideas, guidelines, how can you help the politicians to engage our next generation to how to create stability regarding defense? Maybe take a Couple, can we take a couple more questions, perhaps, so, so that we give a chance to everyone? There's a question over there. Uh, hello there. Uh, my name is Maya. I'm a master's student here at FHS. And uh, we talked a lot about uh, EU, NATO. Um, OK, uh, no. <laughs> EU, NATO uh, cooperation. Um, I'm actually doing my thesis on um, uh, common security and defense uh, policy, European one. Uh, my question would be how likely it is for actually for EU to act more autonomous, so not have the cooperation with NATO that much because, um, you know, in the beginning of the century, NATO didn't really want Europe to have its own autonomy in terms of security and defense. And uh, now, of course, you can see that NATO is gaining its momentum. Do you think that it's likely that um, Europe is going to gain its momentum in terms of their defense? and? Yeah, act more autonomously, or are they gonna actually play the card of cooperation with NATO? Thank you. Thank you. And then one more over here. Ma'am, sirs, uh, do you feel that uh, Russia has set the precedent uh, in changing the uh, uh, world order by violent means? And if so, where do you foresee the next conflict to arise? Okay, some pretty big questions. Who wants to start? 
Lena, do you want to say something to European defense policy? Yes. Um, first of all, something about engaging the teenagers. I think that a positive effect for people in our business, if you can say, sort of researchers in security and defense, is that the, uh, the um, focus on these issues has never been as big. And we are all asked every day to talk to media, to come to schools and talk, and to uh, different NGOs. Uh, and we do that as much as we can. So I think this is, and we have open seminars like this one that we send on the web. And I think that that is something that, that we, um, I mean, it, it's a strange positive side effect of a terrible war, in a sense, because the, the knowledge that, and, and I, I talk for us now as a sort of a collective, the knowledge that we collectively have in the research, uh, in the research society here is, is very useful. Uh, and I think the only thing we can do is to sort of to continue to research and teach and, and try to uh, answer as many questions as we can physically and you know time we do um to to engage people and um, that is uh, yeah the, the sort of the idea that universities should also be in contact with the society around them has really been proven to us now to be very very important that's um, one on that uh, on eu nato cooperation well it's an interesting thing because um well france has this idea that uh, europe needs to have strategic autonomy and when they talk about that, I, my interpretation is that strategic autonomy uh, is really Europe's ability to act without the US. It's not really EU ability to act without, without NATO, because the membership is so overlapping. So it's, it's rather the ability for the European countries to act, maybe in the name of EU, uh, probably in the name of EU, but without the US. And that is something, a, a sort of a political idea that uh, France has. And that is also, I mean, supported to a certain extent that, like some of you said earlier today, that, I mean, the US doesn't really want to be in Europe. I mean, if it hadn't been for, for the way Russia acts, they would have left. They started to leave before, before, before um, I mean, earlier in, in, in they, they had already started to leave and then came Georgia and then came Crimea. And then, then they they had to come back, but um, so so that is um, I, I think that the the idea of EU acting without uh, as as a, as a unity by itself is more of acting without the US than acting without NATO because of the overlapping memberships, and and the structures and the competences and and everything like that. But um, another thing that needs to happen for the EU to be its own actor, it's for the member states to because as I see it right now, the member states are, they haven't decided whether they want to use the EU as a capacity provider only, or whether they want to use it as an actor in defense. And that is, I mean, it's a political decision that has to be made. If you make that as a political decision, obviously then you can, but, but it, it's a political decision that hasn't been made. And, and I, I guess uh, one reason is because they don't agree. <laughs> And this is this is an area where, where you have to you have to have uh, the member states need to agree to change things. So, um, is that an answer? Yeah. Yeah. I also, have some thoughts uh, uh, on all three questions, uh, all three questions actually. But I, I will start with um, my favorite question: the European uh, Union as a, as an independent defense actor. Uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, the, the idea of uh, fulfilling the promise of Article 42 in, in, in the Treaty of Lisbon of creating this uh, Euro, uh, European defense co co cooperation when uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the European Council so decides has one, one problem. And the problem is that this idea of an independent European cooperation looks very differently from different states' point of view. Uh, as uh, Malena just explained, from a French point of view, yes, uh, we, we could use the European cooperation as a way of gaining extra strength to our strategy of strategic autonomy that it we will pursue in any case. Uh, but if you look at those countries that have borders to Russia, for instance, uh, 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 or other uh, Eastern members, I don't think that relying on Germans and French 
for their security is an option as long as the United States is prepared to, to continue, uh, continue to engage itself within NATO. Uh, uh, but as I said uh, previously, uh, I think it's a very good idea that, 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 that the Europeans create a sort of stronger uh, uh, European pillar within NATO. Uh, there is a, a possible answer also to the question, how could uh, a, a real European defense community uh, come, come, come to be? And that is uh, the, the, the experience, experiment that was done in the early 1950s. Uh, at the time of the war uh, in, in, in uh, Korea, uh, the United States started to be very concerned about how we could remilitarize Western Germany. Uh, there's an immediate need for this. Uh, uh, but this was not many years after uh, uh, the Second World War. Uh, uh, so it was politically sensitive uh, and the French government was tasked to do this. And they uh, used their best man, Jean Monnet, the one who designed the, the European coal, coal and steel community. And he came up with his plans for a European defense community. And that was supernatural momentum. It should have one uh, 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 common defense industry. It should have one uh, uh, department of defense, but it should be integrated within NATO structures. And this idea concerned many European leaders because they are used to think of defense as something we actually do on a national basis. Uh, and now we, we are supposed to have a supranational defense. Uh, but the then uh, foreign minister, I think, uh, John Foster Dahl, an old friend of Monet, did a road trip to, to Bonn, to the Benelux countries, uh, 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 main cities, uh, and to Italy, and told them that if you sorry, bosses, don't sign up on this agreement. You could take care of your security on your own. And it rattled in the papers and everything was signed until this issue was taken to, to the French National Embassy, where Charles de Gaulle declared that Napoleon, Napoleon's armies will not uh, uh, be led by an American general. And, and that was it, strategic economy. Uh, if I should say some, some, some very brief about the, the, uh, the question of whether Putin has succeeded uh, or not in using violence to change the European security order. I will say that if we say, as we previously said, he want to have a security order centered on great power, on uh, tension between states because it's promote his in, internal position. Well, he, he has come a very, a very long, 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 long way, at least in destroying the European security order that before that, that we had in the 90s. And he has also come a rather long way in gaining support from Swedish youth to engage in, in defense question. Uh, and our reintroduction of conscription may, may improve that further. So, yeah, or, okay. So just briefly perhaps on, 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 on your question, I think, for the first time now, the, the US wants Europe to defend itself when it comes to conventional uh, military forces. What will remain for the foreseeable future is the uh, American nuclear umbrella. There's no way of scaling up the, the French or the, the British uh, nuclear programs to be able to do that. So that I think is a division of labor you can see, but the Americans right now would want the uh, Europeans to to, to defend themselves. And that's why they've been asking both Obama and Trump and Biden now uh, want the Europeans to, to step up in terms of their conventional defense. We have just enough time for one last question. So. Uh, Jens Pettersson. I would suggest that all use of geopolitical power is an exercise within a coalition of willing. It could be the United Nations, but if members not even pay their membership fee, or if they abstain, of course, the United Nations is weakened. So it's a coalition of the people who pay their membership dues. And the same, of course, is, is true for the, United Na uh, the European Union and NATO. You can be inside the tent, or you could be outside the tent and with, excuse my French, Lyndon B. Johnson's words, 
urinate into the tent or out of the tent. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of the geopolitical power that we have experienced the last decades have been uh, pure coalitions of the willing without carrying the label of United Nations, NATO, or the European Union, because it has been the most efficient way to have all the people in the coalition actually committed. So this is my sort of little uh, 10 cent uh, idea that we are always working within coalitions of willing, irrespective of what framework we can sometimes paste on them. Look, a quick response from one of you or? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obvious that, that uh, I mean, a coalition of the willing to pay or the, or, or the, the, the a coalition of those that are politically most committed or those that have, when it comes to military issues, uh, an expeditionary force that can be uh, dispatched, uh, they will certainly have more influence over the the that uh, military operation, and and uh, that that goes without saying. But but uh, organizations like the EU and NATO, of course, are still reliant on uh, uh, um, uh, some level of support for the common action, and and uh, that will also probably uh, continue to be the the, the, the case. Yeah, but, but, but some have to step up and, of course, lead the way. And in that sense, yes, I, I, I agree with, with, with you. Okay. Well, clearly we could, we could be going on and on, um, but our time is up. Of course, all these issues are the ones that continue to occupy us here at the Swedish Defence University, but also in wider society for the months and years to come, I suspect. Uh, but for now, uh, that's us. So all I have to do now is to ask the uh, audience to generously uh, thank our participants and uh, their contributions. Thank you.